on uh, your PhD on plastic architecture. But um, Lorraine also has a, an appointment, a, a, a recent appointment at, Corn um, at um, Cooper Union. Prior to funding Rika Studio with Inaki, uh, she was a senior architect at Selgas Cano, uh, based in, in, in Madrid. Lorena's professional work has been recognized with several uh, awards in international competitions, uh, too many to mention, but in, in Korea, for example, and various European competitions in Spain, Vienna, and Paris. As well as leading Eureka Studio, as I said, she's teaching at Cornell, uh, sorry, Cooper Union uh, right now, uh, as well as uh, previous assignments at Cor Cornell and uh, California College of the Arts. Inaki is uh, also an architect, an educator, who received his BSc and Master of Architecture also from the Polytech University of Madrid, where I, he, ob he also obtained um, <coughs> his international PhD in 2015. Inaki, together with Lorena, have been recognized with the Venice Biennale's Golden Lion Award in 2016 for the design of the Spanish Pavilion and, its cu and the curation of the inherent ex exhibition thereof uh, called Unfinished. Other awards, as I keep mentioning, are many and include the AIA New York Housing Award 2015, a Design Vanguard Award 2012, Hausler Award 2012, and Emerging Architecture Award with Architectural Record in 2011. Inaki has also won several international competitions in, including, uh, in built projects, including adaptive reuse of Hangar 16 at the former Slaughterhouse of Madrid. Sounds interesting. <laughs> the Pitch House, the pitch house in, in Madrid, which has also been published uh, widely. 45 social housing in Madrid and the restoration, the restoration of, of, I think it's an Ar Arabic tower in Guadalajara, Guadalajara and also an intriguing name, the English for Fun headquarters in Madrid. Um, look forward to hearing a bit more about, about all those. <laughs> Awarded with the Fellowship of the Spanish Academy, uh, he spent a year, a year in Rome in 2007 developing his PhD dissertation on, interestingly, Louis Kahn and Re Robert Venturi's coincidences from G Giancolo to Chestnut Hill. Inaki has also taught at uh, Co uh, Cornell, Cal uh, California College of the Arts, Columbia University, and now uh, we're delighted that he's come here uh, to MIT. Um, just a word, another word of, of welcome. Uh, well, actually, just another word before we serve well, welcome Inaki and Lorena. I'd just like to take a moment to thank uh, all of you, the students, and, and, and our staff who uh, help to run these events. Uh, it's a really important because uh, it's a big job, from the lights to the sound, setting up space, and announcing these events. And I just wanted to say that you know we couldn't do without without you. Thanks also to our Architecture Students Council uh, for taking an active role in helping us propose speakers this semester. This has been a collaborative, collaborative effort uh, between myself and other faculty uh, and the ASC, and we look forward to more collaborations on that in the future. But, of course, we're also grateful for the whole community for taking part and coming together for these events, and this is simply to say, you know, we need your continued support. So, anyway, after all that, uh, please welcome me. Welcome me in. Uh, sorry, not welcome me. <laughs> please, please join me in welcoming Inaki Canacero and Lorena Del Rio. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much uh, for. Uh, giving us this opportunity of sharing our work, and thank you all for, for, for being here. And, and thank you, Sheila, because uh, you are in a way responsible that we are here today. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in the 2016 edition of the Venice Biennale, we had the opportunity to curate and design the Spanish pavilion and reflect on a series of topics that the main curator at that time, Alejandro Aravena, had proposed with the general theme reporting from the front. 
we took this not only as the commission of defining what would be presented in our national pavilion and how, but also as an opportunity to reflect in our practice and our role as architects. The exhibition Unfinished was our response to it, addressing the temporal dimension of architecture. It represented a twofold vision of what happened in Spain since 2008. On the one hand, reporting the negative aspects of the crisis, highlighting many unnecessary buildings that due to their inability to adapt to unexpected changes became ruins. And on the other hand, demonstrating our fascination by the idea of using time as a variable in the equation of the design process. What if we consider time as a design strategy? What if the object of architecture is not a final product, but something that evolves over time? Our interest in flexibility emerges as an answer of our constant preoccupation of time, adaptation, and reuse as critical factors in architecture. We are not interested in creating final objects, but more in generating processes that could lead to multiple results in the interaction with people. So we want to challenge the idea of completion, questioning the notion of a project as something, as something thrown into the future, something that tries to define somehow the time to come and tries to control it as much as possible, and yet embracing the uncertain future life of our design, blurring the signature of the architect as an author and transforming the piece into a collaborative work that involves actions over the years of use. The opportunity of an unfinished architecture examines how certain designs are more likely to be considered as part of a chain that could be continued by others. When considering the opportunity of an unfinished architecture, rethinking the future involves understanding the past, revisiting typologies, understanding how time affects its evolution. Speculating about the future ruin of a project could trigger the inception of a design as a process of projecting ruins in, re in reverse. In a ruin, all superfluous elements have disappeared as a result of the pass of time. A fixed structure and a variable enclosure could allow changes over time without affecting the essence of the project, creating unexpected variations where the boundaries between interior and exterior get blurred. So we also believe that the opportunity of an unfinished architecture relies on the idea that the materialization of a design is not an end, but a means through which we facilitate new space to happen. The creation of a narrative not that is only completed in the interaction with the one experiencing it in motion through space uh, is one of the important parts of, of our uh, design process. The architectural object is intended to be a device to discover new realities, uh, to reveal other readings of the context, but at the same time capable to operate as a body in constant state of evolution, using strategies of transformation and adaptation to respond to a new scenario to come. So tonight, we are going to be presenting two different types of projects. On the one hand, the ones that deal with an existing condition whose starting point is the reuse and transformation of a previous architecture. We think about this project as the present of a given past. On the other hand, we will be talking about a series of new projects, all of them with a domestic program, whose concept departs from the idea of a changing scenario. We think about them as the present state of a future condition, embracing the transformable na nature of time. In both cases, we try to achieve flexibility and to adapt to a mutable uh, future scenario by challenging the idea of the partition. So using, using different strategies to rethink and activate them. So you will see that the partition in each of these projects demonstrates its own personality, playing an important role in the concept or future of the design. The first project that we wanted to share today was completed in the last years of the period of economic pr prosperity. A house designed considering two scenarios, the present where two independent families would be inhabiting the house and a future condition when the economic situation of one of the owners would allow the reconfiguration of the two houses to become a single family one. The house has three levels, basement, first where uh, all the living areas are located, totally open to the landscape, and a second level more introverted where the private spaces are. The cantilever of the second floor allows the sun to hit the interior during winter time, whereas in summer, doesn't even touch the glazed facade, reducing the energy cost 
in the interior. The Beach House offers us an opportunity of studying how flexibility could be achieved by reorganizing the static elements of the house, such as the servant spaces in the ground floor or the storage areas in the second, all attached to the walls, liberating the space to allow the partitions to be changed. A big terrace and a series of sliding doors expand the house to the porch when the weather allows. We decided to use concrete as a constraint to explore different ways to subvert the industrial condition of the material to define a domestic environment. The texture on the of the wood in the formwork, the balance of the masses, the fine gravity, and the connection with other materials became critical during the design process. We were interested in revealing the weight of the concrete volume on the first floor to define the character of the living room. Even though the house is perceived quite big, the interiors are not. That's why every design action was focused on making the user perceive the space bigger than, than what it is. Instead of bringing too many objects, one single piece of furniture was designed, incorporating a place to sit, kitchen, storage, and the main access. The creation of the double height allows the solid diagonal light highlight the longest dimension of the space. One of the existing boulders in the site was used as the main structure of the terrace. At night, the glass partitions become invisible from the exterior, expanding visually the terrace and the swimming pool area to the interior of the house. Whereas during, during the day, the spatial continuity is reversed, making the domestic space being in continuity with the landscape. The next project, the Rocamar House, is located in Playa de los Alemanes, the German's beach, which is a natural and touch oasis in the middle of the very crowded and touristic coast of Cadiz in the south of Spain. The area is characterized by its dunes, constantly redefining the line where the vegetation grows. The site is located in the edge of this boundary on a soft hill full of big rocks, boulders, native plants, and small trees. The low density, with very few constructions scattered in the surroundings, makes the site unique in contrast with the massive urban development in other areas of the Spanish coast. The Rocomar House negotiates with the site conditions, minimizing the transformation of the ground, adapting to the slope and to the existing boulders, and diminishing the visual impact of the construction in the area. The structure mediates between the wild and the domestic, the natural topography and the new datums that relate with the ground and the view of the sea. Our starting point was oriented on respecting the ground as much as possible, keeping its permeability, and given the programmatic constraints, the challenge, the challenge consisted on minimizing the footprint of the house in order to make the least impact on the topography. Four equal concrete Virendel trusses are stacked, generating three different levels. The lower pair of trusses is supported on a concrete box that defines the swimming pool, supported at the same time on the existing rocks. The upper one is arranged perpendicularly on the top of the lower one, cantilever cantilevering both sides and creating an elevated hermetic box in dialogue with the distant view of the beach and the coast. The bottom set of trusses uses the existing rocks to lightly touch the ground, bridging a large span in order to generate an exterior but protected area underneath the construction for service rooms and parking space. This volume creates a podium that houses the swimming pool overlooking the sea and an extensive terrace facing west that captures the last light of the day before the sun disappears behind the ocean. The upper set of trusses rests on the top of the lower one, generating a double height space in the intersection, created by the four structural elements. The upper volume contains the most private spaces of the house. This floating box is also fully open to the views and western light through the space of the loggia that is conceived as a generic room that could be used as an expansion of any of the bedrooms. The loggia, enclosed by sliding windows and revolving shutters, is a space that operates as a device that frames the views, a lens that transforms and augments its perception, a filter that moderates the strong southern light of Spain with a threshold. 
the living room, in continuity with the terrace, defines a rectangular platform that blurs the boundary of the interior domestic space with the landscape. The truss is not only the main structural component, but it's also a permeable partition that defines the boundaries, the element that gives a scale to the domestic space, and the module that brings consistency and unifies the design. The following project, the Canter Domus, is a commission for a diplomat and his family who have been traveling around around the world and now will settle in Madrid. And we have been always interested in the Roman Domus and the public condition of the central space, the atrium, the most attractive and flexible room of the house. Conceived as an ambiguous space, half exterior, half interior, around which all the private chambers of the house are organized. This house is an exercise of reinterpretation of the Domus typology when confronted to a slope topography facing the challenge of an atrium that is no longer attached to the ground. The house is understood as a one big room with the atrium at the core of the space around which all the programs revolve. The most private spaces attached to the northern wall minimize the space they consume in order to maximize, maximize the public area. The sliding partitions allow to reconfigure the house on the different seasons of the year. During winter and fall, the interior spaces define a U-shape, minimizing the space that needs to be heated. Whereas during uh, spring and summertime, the atrium becomes the center of an ambulatory where interior and exterior are no, no longer divided. The facades are designed in continuity with the roof and the perforations are not differentiated in the horizontal and vertical plane. The center windows on the slab connect the interior space with the lower gardens and with the sky, allowing the breeze from the forest to enter and cool naturally the space during the hot season. The house sits subtly on the side, minimizing its presence towards the street, with the rooftop conceived as an extension of the landscape, creating a platform that overlooks the distant views of the city. The volume can deliver above the native vegetation, generating an intimate space in continuity with nature. So the design of this single family house has been the answer of the constraints of a tight program in a very polarized context, as beautiful on one side, as terrible it is on the other. So it's located on the periphery uh, of a very, on a very uh, conventional suburban area near Madrid uh, and the side is an extreme slope overlooking the skyline of the city. So this is the, the um, dark side of the site, and then the slope, uh, which is located in a cul-de-sac on the limit of the neighborhood. Uh, so there are no other constructions in front of, of the site that would interrupt the landscape, uh, the, the view of the landscape toward the, the distant view of the, of the city. So in order to negotiate with the topography and create as much usable exterior space as possible, the house is atomized into three separate volumes, located at three uh, at different heights, maximizing the views. Two of these three parts are embedded in the ground, anchoring the construction and minimizing the visual impact of the house in the landscape. But the third one rises prominently like a periscope in order to capture as much, as much horizon as possible. The space in between becomes a natural green partition, framing the views of Madrid. The site is constrained by its shape, which is a trapezoid. Uh, the short side connects to the street that gives access to the house, where an open parking platform sits at the level of the road. From there, a bridge leads to the main volume, where the living room and the kitchen are placed, spanning the garden located one floor below. The eccentric structure contains the vertical communication for and connects with the two lower levels. So from the street, only the upper volume uh, is visible, discovering only when crossing the bridge, the hidden garden uh, in the level below. The swimming pool uh, um, to the west, the covered terrace, and then an independent space uh, for working in clothes, an open space, which is a backyard, but it's totally open to the distant view of the city. The three pieces that compound the house are moved apart horizontally, but also vertically. So each of them could accomplish different functions. The back pavilion anchors the house to the terrain, acting as a retaining wall. 
at the main volume, supported only by one leg, hovers over the garden, covering a big terrace. And the lowest peak is integrated with the topography and contains the most private spaces of the house, the three bedrooms and two bathrooms. So the residence is uh, split into these two parts by a garden partition, being physically separated by a vault that allows all of them to be in connection with the best side of the polarized context, the views uh, towards the city. The perception of the extreme slope preceding the view of the skyline of Madrid is framed and transformed by a sequence of concrete surfaces, glass walls and water reflections that enlarge, focus and enhance the natural beauty of the site, uh, of this side of the context. So this house is currently under construction, so these are not professional pictures, as you can see, but th that show that the upper volume creates a compressed cover area that emphasizes the scale of the landscape, and that the private area of the house, which is uh, integrated in the, in the topography, is also fully open to the views and the western light. Um. The main floor goes forward into the slope and higher than any other construction around hovering above the landscape, becoming a floating store front where the domestic is juxtaposed with, na juxtaposed with nature. From inside, the beams uh, that make possible the cantilever um, become not only the structural uh, system, but also a bookshelf where the storage of the living room is located. The periscope is just supported by the eccentric core, minimizing its footprint to maximize the dimension of the landscape and becoming a device to capture the view, a lens that transforms its perception. So in a very different context, uh, this is the proposal for a housing project in New York City, where the interface that divides interior from exterior is not meant to augment the beauty of the context, but is intentionally chosen to produce the spaces for sharing and to blur the, hor the horizontal partitions of each floor. The traditional farmhouse typology and the fire escapes epitomize New York's iconography and the identity of many neighborhoods in the city. The streets have historically served for incidental social interaction, children's space for playing, but also space for neighbor chaos. While the fire escapes operate in some cases as extensions of the interior space overlooking the streets, creating spaces for potential community engagement. So our proposal combines characteristics of both iconic typologies and proposes an extension of the street life all the way up to the roof, promoting social life in the community. The descending platforms in the facade also serve as egress stairs. The removal of it from the interior of the building allows for an arrangement of a most efficient interior apartment floor plan, an opportunity for an expanded outdoor social space uh, towards the exterior. The building is conceived as a modular prefabricated system of structural cross-laminated timber that allows minimizing both construction cost, cost and also uh, the building embodied on wood. All components will arrive flat, flat packed to the site and be assembled as a series of slabs and walls resulting in a cleaner and quieter uh, construction method, which is important in, in street projects. The facade becomes a showcase of the interior life of the building offering a storefront of domestic urban life and blurring the vertical partition between the different floors. The interior space appropriates the exterior as an extension of it, where the boundaries of the private space and are blurred, promoting social interaction. The reading uh, of architecture as an incomplete organism, somehow unfinished, help us to engage with contemporary conversations that are addressing new ways of living. The concept of an incomplete house proposes the question of what elements constitute a domestic space according to the contemporary way of living. In this particular case, uh, which is also an invited competition, we were addressing how to design a domestic space to, li to live and work outside of the city in contact uh, with nature. So we got inspired by the clarity of the traditional Japanese home where the core of the house is defined by a generic space that can be used in multiple ways surrounded by the servant elements. In our case, the 10-story house is a three-dimensional interpretation where the central space remains empty and is surrounded by a series of partitions that climb up, defining a spiral of servant spaces potentially uh, used in multiple ways. The spiral, besides defining the circulation of the house, also creates a complex vertical section that allows the user to inhabit the space in unconventional ways. 
the central space operate as an extension of the program of each of the partitions when activated by the inhabitant. The sliding, the sliding panels that define the enclosure move vertically and horizontally to expand the exterior, sorry, to expand the interior and tracing towards the exterior the different ways of using it. The transparency of the structure favors a more intense connection with nature from the inside, but also blending the structure with the context from the outside. Another investigation on new transformable domesticity is a proposal for the revolutionary house. We have been always fascinated by how architecture um, of the windmills responds perfectly to the need of harvesting energy through movement. Also how sometimes a design invention emerges when there is an unconventional need, in this case, the revolving table that allows to read several books at the same time. Or when architecture is capable to uh, scale up a machine gun and make it inhabitable and host canyons and revolve to be more efficient in the repetitive shooting of a target. We thought about the potential of incorporating mechanisms of rotation for this commission, a weekend house located in a site where the rectangular, where, where the regulations only allow constructions of a maximum 250 square footage, square feet. The very limited square feet didn't prevent us to fulfill the desire of our client that originally was replicating the Bates house. We wanted to incorporate what we thought was the most luxurious space of the house, a 15 by 15 feet square that opens up to the landscape. And we speculated about different ways of inhabiting this space, this space by playing with movable partitions. And we ended up defining a secondary steel enclosure compound by four smaller squares that could be deployed by a simple mechanism of rotation, expanding the 250 square feet when inhabiting uh, to double when inhabiting the space, variating from an herbetic box to a space open to the landscape. And so here we can see how uh, when the user arrives to the, to the house during the weekends, the first move would be open the secondary enclosure, sliding uh, the windows uh, to duplicate the square feet of uh, the unit and then keeping the central space completely open to the landscape and at the same time having these secondary spaces as uh, bedrooms and as a kitchen and as a bathroom. Now we start with a series of projects, all of them explorations into reusing existing buildings, starting with the renovation of the Hangar 16, the former slaughterhouse in Madrid, a building abandoned for decades until uh, this uh, international competition was launched. The site is surrounded by the M30, what used to be in Madrid a big ring road full of traffic. The international competition was launched with the intention of reusing this hangar to accommodate the permanent art collection of ARCO, which is a very important art fair that happens in Madrid every year. In recent years, this highway was buried and the space became one of the biggest uh, public parks in Europe. The interior was not a particularly interesting space when, when we visit during the competition phase, but the scale of it was similar to a cathedral, or at least that's how we imagined since the beginning. The proposal for the competition that we titled The Doors was interested in creating a simple mechanism of rotation that would provide flexibility to allow different configurations of the space, not only responding to the given exhibition program, but also offering different uh, possibilities. And so this is the moment of the crisis in Spain and uh, for a certain period of time, we thought that we were never going to be able to complete this, uh, this project. So we decided to, um, uh, to do this video in order to collect all the mock-ups, all the ideas and all the solutions that um, we discussed in the office and, and keep this as, as, as something that would uh, keep our spirit positive even though it was this sad moment of the crisis. 
Uh, but the interesting thing is that when the client saw the video, they, they liked it very much, and they uh, convinced us to um, redevelop the proposal with half of the budget. And, and it was a lesson uh, for us because, in a way, we uh, removed all the superfluous uh, and, and non-necessary elements of the project, and we basically realized that we needed to keep only one, one element to solve everything, which was the revolving door that would be uh, reconfiguring the space in multiple ways. So the strategy was creating an, an autonomous, transformable box inside of the existing space. The shape of it was defined by using a series of two simple steel panels of six meters high connected by hinges that would produce multiple configurations. During construction process, we didn't want to incorporate another material besides the steel, but we could demolish the plaster layer of the walls to reveal the back side of the original neo mudejar facade built at the beginning of the 20th century in Madrid. So that's the exterior. So by doing so, we rebuilt the back side of the wall that was never meant to be shown. The construction techniques used at that time brought back not only the memory of the place, but also it changed the perception of the scale of the space. So this box changes according to the movement of the doors, sometimes opening second level to allow natural light to enter inside, sometimes showing the old wall, but sometimes defining an hermetic box isolated from the rest of the building. The constraints of always using the two steel uh, panels connected by hinges that was taken as a premise in some cases produced unexpected geometries and unconventional solutions. The shutters uh, defined by the original windows or the benches hidden in the thickness of the wall. The same module was folded horizontally to provide privacy in the access to the restrooms, where the same logic is applied. In the main access to the building, it was necessary to create compression that would reinforce the monumentality of the, inter of the interior. A different rotating mechanism, in this case, horizontal, allow us to transform one of the doors into a canopy. And the space uh, since uh, the construction was completed, has been used in multiple ways as a space for exhibition, for workshops, uh, lectures, concerts, and all types of uh, cultural activities that you can imagine. The restoration of an Arabic tower was an interesting commission since it came without any information of plans, pictures, or history of the site. So we decided to start the design building a narrative that came out of speculating about the inhabitants of that tower centuries ago, maybe a princess. But when we finally got the chance to visit the site, we realized that the tower they wanted to be restored was this one. Basically, they wanted to rebuild the original shape of the tower without any access or spaces inside. So we finally convinced them to within the budget they had, making it inhabitable. So using the narrative of this imaginary princess gave us the opportunity to, to reflect on how to solve the access to a tower, not just by opening a hole in the wall, but as a promenade for our imaginary princess to discover the landscape. So in order to get uh, in, it's necessary to take the, the bridge close to the cliff and experience the risk of falling down. It was then when we decided to use aluminum as the only material for the whole intervention. The intention of making this access as light as possible was oriented to reinforce by opposition what we thought was the main quality of the tower, the weight and the thickness of the walls. So besides offering a promenade for this uh, imaginary inhabitant, it became a device to contemplate the landscape before entering inside. Because of the lightness of the new structure, we became aware of the heavy walls that have remained structural for, for centuries. In order to inhabit the interior, we created ghosted partitions, providing access to all different levels, allowing natural light to enter in a space where originally it wasn't meant to be. 
the small secret, secret room inside the tower was revealed before taking the stairs that lead to the roof made by a tensile metal screen. The transparency of the new structure permitted the understanding of the solid original construction, revealing the upper level, the dialogue of opposition, than the old and the new generate, generates. So the unfinished architecture defends the strategies of occupation, transformation, and adaptation um, of existing structures that are take it, taken as a given constraint, allowing unexpected solutions. For this project, the English for Farm News Center in Madrid, we were asked to transform a conventional office building into the new um, preschool institution, uh, which is the only one uh, connected to the American school in Madrid that follows the Reggio Emilia pedagogy. So we wanted to design um, a space that could represent the more, the, the more important principles of this type of education. And these principles are three. The first one being the child uh, is always the center of the learning process. Uh, the built environment is considered the first teacher together to with the real teachers, like physical teachers that are there, and the parents. So it was like a bit of a responsibility for us thinking that our space would be considered like that. And then the learning process has to be digital. So the space should be able to somehow showcase that process. The goal was to create a play and learning space very much in the spirit of the adventure playgrounds where the play objects that are not really toys only develop their full potential in the interaction with the kids. And all of this should happen at two different scales, at the scale of the children and at the scale of the adults. So we wanted to create a thinker's tray where all the objects involved in the play and learning process could be explored. The work produced could be exhibited and the kids could, could also feel that they could be part of the show. The strategy we follow was to propose uh, a thick wall to divide the space um, instead of thin partitions, creating an inhabitable structure uh, that will be our thinker tray and that will storage all the furniture and objects that were not in use, um, are not needed in the space, making the configuration of the rooms uh, very different. By dividing the rooms with an active wall, the same space that usually only serves for circulation is activated and can be used as a meeting place for kids, for teachers and parents and also can showcase all the work produced in the classroom. By creating visual connections, we blur the boundary of each space, making all parts of the school participate of the activities uh, inside of the classroom. The broken geometry of the structure also creates a series of small spaces that can be only inhabited by the kids. So we propose a flexible, adaptable, and hopefully participatory design for kids that can reinvent the game every day and transform the school as they learn. Another intervention on an existing building uh, was this competition for an elementary school at Playville in Paris. The project was an investigation around how the built environment can create a sense of, of identity and community. We wanted the new school to be a safe place uh, because it's located in a, a difficult neighborhood uh, with most of the population being first uh, generation there or immigrants that just arrived. So we use, we use the uh, iconicity of the beach group uh, to represent, which is present in the neighborhood, to subvert the identity of the old indus industrial area and give it a new meaning, the perception of a domestic and familiar environment. We operated in the system by strategically cutting, removing, and adding pieces in order to introduce the smaller scale and the different programs and a central public cost at the core of the proposal. We were transforming an industrial building into a, into a school. So the project uh, intends to generate the fiction of a welcoming town where the children can feel uh, that they belong. A thickened partition is used to separate the space of the classroom from the common areas, storing all the furniture needed, but making the system more flexible and reconsidering. This competition allowed, uh, uh, allowed us to think about the library of the future, or what means um, to define or to design a library today. That should go beyond the loan and consultation of books. It should be a dynamic space of creation, of exchange, of knowledge and ideas that opens a door of connections with the world, incorporating new technologies. Uh, flexibility and transformation, again, were key factors for this new concept of a library. 
So we started by designing a series of smart partitions capable to transform, move, and contain different activities were defined uh, in order to resolve uh, all the programmatic requirements. The new library is intended to be a public meeting point, so the outdoor space expands into the heart of the building, creating what we call the Agora. This central space can be made independent, allowing temporary alternative uses, uh, encouraging collective activities, but without interfering with the everyday life of the library. So we try to mix two productive programs um, that are somehow connected in a hybrid building that goes beyond the sum of the parts. So the space for intellectual production is embraced with a space for food production, an orchard that we uh, propose on the second floor of the library, enriching, another, uh, enriching one to another and diluting the barriers between interior and exterior. So the result is a flexible, versatile building at the service of the community. The double height of the Agora allows the everyday to happen in an extraordinary space, but also allows the extraordinary to happen in a natural way integrated with the day-to-day -day uses. The new library is also understood as an accessible space, inviting everybody to feel integrated, generating a series of augmented accesses to open up public spaces to the maximum, minimizing tension and eliminating all the barriers. Also encouraging shared spaces, uh, sorry, shared programs between interior and exterior, and fostering flexible spaces where other activities could leave the domestic sphere maybe and take place in the public realm, promoting gender equality and family conciliation. The new library is also a pedago pedagogical building in the sense that represents the ideals of a more sustainable architecture, aiming for a very high level um, of energy efficiency. The glazed greenhouse attached to the south facade with its operable apertures modulates the coolant and the heating of the interior in a passive way. The smart partitions contain everything that is needed to create an experiential learning space capable of stimulating the senses, making the user more connected to the exterior spaces, uh, being aware of the, of the perception of the pass of time and the changing seasons and the micro ecosystem generated around the new container of knowledge. And we will finish this presentation uh, with the same project that we started and its variation. The unfinished exhibition of the Spanish pavilion for the 2015 uh, Venice Biennale, where the need to report the consequence of the 2008 economic crisis was subverted in order to reveal attributes and design strategies that emerged from the unfinished. The central space of the pavilion showed seven photographic series, bringing a different reading of the unfinished sometimes using irony to report the unstoppable desire of our society for owning a house, sometimes forgetting the real need we all uh, have of inhabitation, sometimes showing fragments, fragmented demolitions that reveal a new reading of space and relations between the old and the new, sometimes showing destruction, demolition, scratches, where all the visible forces of construction process become real, sometimes reporting the urbanism of the roundabouts and how it, it has colonized hundreds of thousands of square meter meters of our territory without any purpose because the architecture never arrived. These photographic series were exhibited in the central space of the Spanish pavilion on a hanging structure made by the simplest architectural element that we could find, the stud, an element that is meant to be invisible in wall partitions. But in this case, they became the driving force of the construction. With a simple motor, the whole, con the whole structure could be lifted and the space would be transformed into an informal room for debates during the whole Biennale. Um, a video that, that it was uh, uh, shot the day before, Um, to hear, um, um, I don't know why the music is not working, but oh, because if I talk, so this idea of juxtaposing all the photographic series together, 
we joke about this idea that in, in Venice, when probably most of you will be there uh, this summer, you don't have time to visit everything. So we were joking about this idea of showing, allowing the people that would be spent only five seconds in our pavilion to see all the pictures at the same time. Um, so the exhibition is curated in a way that is responding to all the people, the people uh, spending five seconds inside of the pavilion, uh, people that might want to be 10 minutes, maybe reading a little bit more, and a more thorough explanation of each of the projects for those who really want to learn about each of the projects that were exhibited in the rooms that surround the central space. So on the one hand, again, we were reporting this unfinished uh, construction, but at the same time, we showed 55 uh, build projects in an open call uh, where uh, we received more than 400 submissions of people who have been dealing with this uh, unfinished condition of architecture, um, uh, producing projects that uh, necessarily need to negotiate with uh, pre-existing, and also projects that part of the strategy incorporate thinking about the future uh, condition of the building. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, the exhibition was designed for, again, for the Spanish pavilion, but then it traveled to many other places, so we needed to, to adapt uh, with the same constraints of the stats and, and the format of the frames to other places like Santo Domingo, uh, Mexico City, or even in New York, where every time we found an opportunity to rearrange the, the, the stats and define a new space uh, in, in, in a different dialogue with the existing uh, context. And we would like to, to finish the presentation with the same quote that we started from Mark Hoge that reminds us the constant uh, duality that we as architects are immersed by reading the city with a certain apathy, apathy or on the contrary, uh, proactively imagine a better future. So thank you very much.